Joining us today is Isis So, who is a master's student in neuroscience at the Institute of Medical Science at the University of Toronto. Isis was my TA this semester for a neuroscience lab course, and having heard about her amazing experiences during one of her talks at a second year learning community last year, we had to have her on the show. Welcome Isis, and we're super excited to have you here. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. My pleasure to be here. So let's start off with our first question. Could you tell us a bit about the neuroimaging research that you're doing with your master's right now? Yeah, so the lab that I'm in, my supervisor is Dr. Robin Green, um, and our lab does work on studying the neural correlates of recovery after traumatic brain injury. So um, for my master's, because one of my research interests is uh, neuroimaging, we thought it would be really interesting to combine that with looking at how does the brain recover after a traumatic brain injury. And so uh, the techniques that we're using include functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, um, and a lot of my work will involve looking at the traje trajectory and natural progression of the, or the history of uh, recovery over time and looking at whether the brains of patients who suffer from traumatic brain injury, moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, uh, whether those brains recover or degenerate over a long period of time. So that's pretty much my project in a nutshell. For my thesis, a lot of my work uh, will involve the analysis of that data. So I'm really excited to, to be doing that and to kind of carry on what I've been doing in my third and fourth years in the lab. Can I ask like, what your hypothesis is? Uh, yes. This work. <laughs> yeah. So we're still setting, we're still setting the objectives and hypotheses and things like that, or we're still setting the question, um, narrowing down on what we want to ask, because there are so many things that we can't ask from the data that we have. And so from what I can understand right now, my, I guess my primary objective is to look at um, if we were to so you categorize the patients based on other outcomes that have been collected in that study, looking at, for example, their functional data, uh, functional outcomes, or their behavioral data, or looking at uh, cognitive outcomes. So from those outcomes, try to categorize if the patients have been um, improving over time, or if they haven't been improving over time. So categorizing based on that, either on a binary categorization or a more, I guess, over a scale, we can use that to then say, okay, now we look at the functional data, the functional fMRI, the functional MRI data, and see how does the functional connectivity changes? How do those changes and signals map on to the data that we already have? And so knowing that objective, I guess you could say then my hypothesis is that if we see, say, well, we have control data, I should also say. So we have data from healthy controls who don't have uh, a traumatic brain injury. And if we were to compare the data between the healthy controls and those who improved over time, we would imagine that that data would align with each other, right? So we would imagine that the functional connectivity changes of those who improved over time would kind of look similar to the data in the control group. And then we would also imagine that from uh, those who declined over time, we might see uh, changes in their connectivity. I'm hypothesizing that we would see hyperconnectivity, so an increase in functional connectivity uh, signals uh, in different brain regions, and mainly because um, there's a hypothesis in the field that says, there's a theory in the field really that says, um, when you have brain damage that's structural, uh, sometimes to compensate for that, you get increased functional connectivity, or increased um, signaling between the regions because they're trying to compensate for a structural loss. Um, they're still trying to do the same function, but it, it drags more resources, so to speak, from different areas of the brain to do that function. Um, so those are my working hypotheses. I'm kind of still setting my objectives and questions, uh, but that's what I think I might see when I actually uh, dig into the data. If you have increased functional connectivity in the injured individuals, you wouldn't see improved function 
like improved behavioral outcome? Yeah, so there are many types of behavioral outcomes, but some of the things that we look at uh, include depression and anxiety. So we would imagine, for example, in someone who suffers from a traumatic brain injury, mild, moderate to severe, that you would likely see greater signs of anxiety or greater signs of depression. And we might think that the functional connectivity changes might also kind of reflect those behavioral changes. So for example, and this is a little bit more targeted, but we might suspect that some networks that are involved in behavior and some networks that are involved in mood and cognition might see differences and changes in how their connectivity and how that, that connectivity works. Um, and that those changes might be reflected in the behavioral data or the cognitive data that we collect. And so another objective, I guess, of my thesis is to think about um, potentially narrowing down, narrowing into a network, uh, a neural network. So almost like a group of brain regions that have a similar function. And so one network that I'm interested in focusing on is the central executive network. And this network is involved in cognition. And we have a bunch of cognitive data uh, that has been collected on memory and attention and speed of processing, for example. And so it would be really interesting to see, okay, if we see decline in memory or we see decline in attention and overall just executive functioning and decision-making, if we see signs of that kind of decline over time in this uh, population, then are these changes also reflected by some sort of change in the functional connectivity in that network? And that's something that we can use resting state fMRI to uh, determine. This might be a bit speculative, but how might you think that this re- kind of research would contribute to treatment of TBI? It's a great question because significance is always something that we want to know and something that we want to understand. And Overall, I would say by understanding how these changes happen, first of all, what kinds of changes happen, and then try to think about, okay, we see these types of changes in XYZ location at a particular time after injury. So now we can say, we can ask the question of, okay, say at eight months time post-injury, we see decline happening fastest. So then that kind of means that before eight months, we have to make sure that that's where rehabilitation and that's where treatment comes in. Because we want to know, we want to be able to inform treatment and rehabilitation plans and strategies. And we can't really know that unless we know what types of, what types of um, changes happen in the brain, if they, what kinds of effects do they have on behavior and cognition and overall functional outcomes of that individual. That's kind of why we do what we do. So by studying the neural networks themselves, if you can somehow pinpoint like the neural network that you were talking about and kind of conclude that to be the culprit of all the negative behavioral outcomes, could you somehow target that for treatment specifically? Yeah, Yeah. so that's also a great, great example as well. That's a little bit beyond the realm of what uh, our lab does, but there are, for example, if you know, like, There are some studies that use um, other techniques like deep brain stimulation to treat things like depression um, or anxiety. And I wouldn't say, you know, the central executive network is the one that is a network that that that's involved in mood primarily, but it does have effects on cognition and attention. Um, And all of those things are really connected, I guess, in the brain and in a person's function. And I would say, Yes, if you knew where, you know, theoretically speaking, if you knew where something was happening, then you can use that as a target for treatment. But something else that I want to add is that the brain is very complex. So a lot of times, and definitely, you know, TBI, traumatic brain injury is very heterogeneous. So it depends on the patient and their demographics as well. Um, And every brain injury is different. So it's hard to pinpoint and say, one particular target, but we can say we might be able to use this work to think also about prognostics and uh, predictors of recovery or predictors of decline. And to use that data, for example, if we can collect enough of it, or we have 
enough like replicates of the same type of type of experiment or similar types of experiment or um, I guess if you have a consensus I guess in the results that you find in the field then yeah you might be able to say okay maybe this is the map of or to the trajectory of how recovery or decline happens. And then maybe you can also say, say I have a patient who suffers from a traumatic brain injury. How does that particular patient map onto the population that we already know about? And can we predict their outcomes over time? So that's something that can be done. I think definitely that's not something that, you know, my thesis alone will be able to solve, but that is something that I guess the overall significance of the type of worker field wants to do. And I think something else that's important for me to add is that now with machine learning and the rise in technology and the improvements and everything, I think something that's really going to impact this field in the future is very likely artificial intelligence and machine learning and using computers to analyze big data. A lot of times neuroimaging data takes up a lot of memory. There are a lot of types of neuroimaging data. So fMRI is just one type and it's functional, but we also have MRI and DTI that's structural. And then that's only one, you know, a couple types of of neuroimaging data. You also have EEG, MEG, you have lots of different types of things that you can measure and quantify in the brain. And it's difficult to just pull one technique out and say, it's going to be able to solve all the questions or answer everything. But I think having all of that data and compiling all of that together Uh, and doing analysis like that, that would be really helpful in providing a more comprehensive picture of what's actually going on. And that's something that machine learning and algorithms will be able to do that humans cannot. Um, So that's also really exciting. Yeah, it definitely is. Has your lab or maybe other labs um, applied machine learning to the MRI data that you have? I don't think our lab has. um, And our lab is definitely not completely computational. It's definitely very much clinical, but I do know that there are labs even at U of T that do use machine learning to look at MRI data. Maybe not with regards to traumatic brain injury, even though I feel like that probably does exist somewhere in the world, but that's definitely something that that's a big field. Like data science is a big field and uh, using those techniques and stats and combining all of those computational methods to look at data. That's also something that's on the rise right now, I think. 